Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child through the method of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. This episode, we have a gift for all of our listeners, an early Christmas gift. Some of you might have noticed that in our series of the religious potential of the child, there was one lone chapter that we have not explored. Chapter 6, The Historical Events in the Life of Jesus Christ. And so for this episode, we are going to gift you all the audio version of this chapter where Rebecca Reutsevich reads the chapter for us. Now we have the audio version of the whole book on our premium Podbean channel. So if you want to purchase the whole audio version of this book, you can check out the notes to see how to do that. But for this episode you have free access to chapter six, which is so perfect for this season that we are in. We're about to enter into this Christmas season. And this chapter, which talks about the historical events in the life of Jesus Christ, dives into that a little bit, especially into how we explore these events with children. I hope you enjoy. Chapter six, the historical events in the life of Jesus Christ. Good news of a great joy which will come to all the people. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. When we come to consider how to introduce the child to the Bible, we are immediately faced with the dilemma of whether to begin with the Old or the New Testament. There is only one covenant between God and humankind, but it is realized in successive stages. Should we make the child retrace this development from its beginning? We have already replied in part to this question in chapter 3, where we stress the centrality of the person of Christ in our catechesis. In our estimation, children should be initiated into their present religious reality, and fundamental to it is the presence of a mediator through whom we go to the Father. Moreover, in order to approach the Old Testament, it is necessary to be able to move easily within time and to be able to imagine customs and habits different from our own. What impression would a child receive, for example, from the account of the sacrifice of Isaac without knowing or being able to understand that there were cultures in which the offering of a son in sacrifice was an act deemed pleasing to their deity. We maintain that the children's initiation to the Old Testament should not begin before the age of eight. Further, we should not let ourselves be deceived by the apparent facility of many pages of the Bible. In the Bible, we find a vast abundance of facts, impressive and easy to recount. We should make an accurate choice of these to present to children, concentrating solely on the passages, the theological meaning of which the child can penetrate. The Bible is a book of historical theology or theological history. We cannot separate theology from history in the Bible, for if we did, we would be unfaithful to the message. There are many biblical passages, the history of which the child easily learns, without piercing through to their theology. We should carefully avoid such passages. Otherwise, we risk making the Bible become a book of stories, if not tall tales. If, for example, we were to present a child with the account of original sin— It would be taken in the same way as a fairy tale, where animals speak. However, the child could in no sense understand its meaning or teaching. In our view, it is a mistake to give children texts that are predominantly, if not exclusively, narrative in nature. As a matter of fact, we think that the more articulated and detailed the narration the greater the risk that it will obstruct the children from reaching its depth. I do not think it right that the child first knows certain facts 
and only at a later time enter into their theological significance. I believe that an event learned only as a story or legend will stay a story, even when the child is grown, and it will be extremely difficult to recover its theological content later on. The children's drawings can be a guide in our choice of text. If the child, in relation to a specific biblical passage, only knows how to draw descriptive rather than interpretive illustrations, then it is better to avoid that text. It is obvious that his understanding of it has stayed on the level of superficiality. On the other hand, there are numerous biblical passages the child is capable of penetrating deeply. The richness of content in the drawings reproduced in this book proves this fact. Why not concentrate on texts such as these? The Prophecies With regard to the Old Testament, we have limited ourselves up to the present to giving children under six years of age a selection of a few short prophetic passages during the season of Advent. Prophetic language is composed of images, and consequently it corresponds very well to the capacities of even young children. Isaiah has appeared to be especially striking. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. As we have seen, the child associates the images of Christ the light and Christ the good shepherd, and both, mutually completing one another, are impressed in the child's mind in an ineffaceable manner. In the same year or in following years, depending on the children's age and receptive abilities, other short passages may be added. For example, the following verse from Isaiah that announces the one through whom the light will come to us. The light bearer will be a child with wonderful names. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Catechists may find other passages. They're just as striking. What seems important to us is that the texts be few in number, brief in length, and formulated in images. Other texts that we give gradually to the children are those that speak of the mother of Christ. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And also the passage that tells of the Messiah's birthplace. But you, O Bethlehem, who are little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one is to be ruler in Israel. Micah chapter 5, verse 1. In this text, Micah highlights the small, great contrast that plays such a large role in the Bible and is so impressive to the children. Our aim in giving these Old Testament texts is not to initiate the children into the Old Testament, which would require, as we said, a historical sensibility that children under the age of six cannot have. Our aim is to offer images and expressions that are striking to and readily grasped by the children. We will show later how the various names of the Messiah Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, furnish the child with a language of prayer. The New Testament, the Incarnation. 
With the exception of these few prophetic passages, we keep primarily to the New Testament, centering on the parables and the events of the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ. We greatly restrict our discussion of the miracles. It seems to us that the particular power Jesus manifested in working miracles should not be separated from the consideration of that power he continues to exercise through the church. But to achieve this unity with the children has proved difficult up to the present. On the other hand, the miracles considered on their own can tempt the children, in our view, into the world of magic that many assert to be indivisible from the religiousness of the child. However, it is a quality we have never seen in children, except for that magic which has been induced by the adult. The events of Christ's infancy appear rather difficult due to the misuse that has generally been made of them by often telling them with many diminutives, as if they were beautiful fables. The fact is that the infancy narratives especially in Luke, are a type of theological tapestry, if it is possible to call them so, whereby the evangelist stresses the grandeur of the mystery he is announcing through a variety of techniques. These are pages of exceedingly rich theological content. Their theology is neither systematic nor explicit, but one that is almost hidden in the text. We are dealing with a theology that is completely different from the textbook kind of theology. It cannot be learned through academic study, but rather gleaned through a prolonged listening to the text. It is a theology characteristically elusive. The evangelist alludes many times to a connection between the events he is speaking about and the history that has preceded them. It has been pointed out that the celestial messengers who address the mother of God and the shepherds structure their speech basically along the lines of the prophetic proclamations. They invite us, first, not to be afraid. Secondly, because the Lord is near, and thirdly, to rejoice, therefore. See, for example, in Zephaniah. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cast out your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear evil no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. These elements are found in the Gospel of Luke as well. Rejoice, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Do not be afraid, Mary. And later, in the words addressed to the shepherds, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which will come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The references are apparent, and it is through illusions such as these that the evangelist tells us, or better, lets us discover, that the new event he is proclaiming is the conclusive link in a long chain of events to which it is in some way connected. The illusion is clear, but not explicit, so the text leaves room for our own search and joy of discovery. In this way, we become accustomed to discovering 
in the literary form of biblical passages, the signs of the mystery. It is not possible to speak to the young child with whom it is inadvisable to increase the number of Old Testament passages of the connection we mention. Nevertheless, knowing this relation will help catechists to rediscover the greatness of the infancy narratives, which perhaps is not always obvious to us. The Lucan texts we have been speaking about also emphasize a great contrast. Many expressions have an awesome grandeur. Others refer to a very simple reality. The child is spoken of as the Son of the Most High, Son of God, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. He is the Savior, and the evangelist calls him by the name of Lord, that name which the Old Testament reserved jealously for God alone. Stars and celestial powers move around the crib, but at the same time, it is said of him, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths. The evangelist Matthew says, Mary had borne a son and called his name Jesus. These contrasts are not without significance. They bring us face to face with the wonderful reality of the child, son of a woman, like each one of us, and son of God. The catechist should have this contrast in mind when speaking with the children so as to lead them to ask questions full of wonder. But who can this child be? In this way, we will accustom the children to the fact that the biblical text contains something to be discovered, which is to be read in depth, which is not readily exhaustible. In this way, we will educate the children to humility in facing the Word of God. Meditation and Prayer on the Mystery of the Incarnation When we present a biblical text, it is important to remember that there is one teacher who is Christ himself. The word we present is the means by which the child can have direct contact with the text, and we share in this direct contact along with the child. At the risk of repeating myself, if a catechist has 15 children before her to listen to a text, there are actually 16 listeners. With the three points above in mind, It is obvious that the adult must abstain from prefacing the reading of the text by narrating it in her own words. Even worse would be to embellish or add superficial emotion to the content of the text. This would be to rob the word of its own power for all those who are listening. A Mexican catechist once chastised herself in her personal atrium diary, saying, I have given the presentation to the children. I have not received it with them. The only thing we need to say before reading the text is to offer the briefest of introductions about what we are about to hear and to note any particularly important words in the text which are less likely to be familiar to the children. For example, in the case of the Annunciation, we might begin by acknowledging that, along with the whole church, we are in the special time of waiting and preparing for Christmas. Whose birth are we preparing to celebrate? We might also ask a wonder question, such as, Would God choose a special mother for Jesus? Do we already know her name? Let's listen to God's word from the Holy Bible to hear how she found out that she was to be Jesus' mother. 
we should accustom ourselves to a living reading of the text. That is, we should feel ourselves personally involved in the listening and the response to the text. The reflection that follows the reading is for this purpose. For instance, the words the angel proclaimed to the mother of God are addressed to us as well, to me too. How shall we respond? Mary expressed her joy, saying, My soul magnifies the Lord. Her joy is mine too. It is a great joy which will come to all the people. And how shall I express it? The shepherds were the first to know that a Savior was born, who is Christ the Lord. They searched for him and found a babe lying in a manger with his mother beside him. The shepherds were astonished and happy, and they glorified and praised God. The Magi came to the crib after a long journey. They knelt down before him. They worshipped him and brought him gifts. But now we too are around the crib. I am here too. What shall we do? What shall we say? In order to facilitate and support personal expression, we introduce some examples of prayer. Each of the infancy narratives contains a prayer. In the angel's words to the mother of God, we have the beginning of the Hail Mary. The Magnificat is the song of thanksgiving on the occasion of the visit to Elizabeth. The angels sing the Gloria at Christ's birth. During the presentation in the temple, the aged Simeon prays the Nunc Demetis the second part of which is a magnificent hymn to Christ the light, which may be given to the children. A light to enlighten the pagans and the glory of your people Israel. Luke chapter 2, verse 32. Such examples should be offered to the children with great discretion so as not to stifle their own personal prayer. If we wish to give the Magnificat, for instance, we restrict ourselves to suggesting only the first verse, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 47. We give a text like this as one example among many of the ways one may respond to God as a stimulus to personal prayer, so that each person finds in her own heart her response to the Lord, who speaks to his creatures. In the presentation of the parables, the reflection following the reading of the text usually leads to meditation and through it to prayer. This reflection has shown itself to be a more direct initiation to personal prayer. The presentation of the events surrounding Christ's birth easily gives rise to celebrations in the true and real sense of the word. In the Advent season, for instance, following the presentation of the prophetic proclamations, we may encourage a procession of waiting in which the children carry the statue of the Mother of God. During Christmas time, there may be a procession with the child and mother, linked to the reading of the Gospel text. After Christmas, as a kind of epiphany celebration, there is the offering of the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and other gifts in general, and so on. At other times, the younger children, with the older children's help, will dramatize events relating to the infancy narratives. With the child's personal work on the infancy narratives, there is a material composed of a series of miniature reconstructed scenes, one for each event, 
almost like an advanced manger scene or diorama, which the children work with in small groups or individually. This material is prepared according to a criterion different from that used for the parable material. The figures are three-dimensional, and the historical character of these events permits and requires research into details, not indicated by the text, that make the scene more living. The difference between parable and historical events should be clear even from the material itself. The material reconstructions of the infancy narrative series help the children who do not know how to read to recall the biblical content. The older children have at their disposal as well as the material a set of gospel booklets, one for each event. The children read the text and construct the scene at the same time. The events we present to the children are the Annunciation, the Visitation, the Adoration of the Shepherds, the Adoration of the Magi, the Presentation in the Temple, and the Flight into Egypt for Older Children. The depth of the children's penetration of the mystery of the Incarnation is shown in their prayer, such as Carlo, six years old, who prayed before the child's crib. I say to him, Alleluia to the mighty God. Expressions like this are a warning for us not to use baby talk with children, not to minimize what they know how to receive in all its greatness. We have observed how easily we speak in diminutives, whereas the child speaks of the mighty God. In their drawings, the children do not limit themselves to drawing the crib. Rather, they give it a theological interpretation. In drawing number 36, the figure depicted over the stable is intended to be the Holy Spirit. The young artist of drawing 37 has achieved a most interesting synthesis. The birth is linked to Easter indicated by the lighted paschal candle, and to our participation in the mystery, represented by the baptismal symbols of the cross and white gown. Both of these drawings were done by children around 11 years of age who live in the steppes of Chad. The same connection between Christmas and Easter is found in the drawings 38, 39, and 40 illustrated by five-year-old children during the Christmas season in different centers in Rome. In these drawings, note the prevalence of the color yellow, which expresses joy, and the representation of Jesus on the cross, that he is alive. In the drawing of four-year-old Giulio, the nativity star dominates his illustration of the Last Supper, figure 47. Maria Azura, five years old, has drawn a lighted candle on either side of the child Jesus, reminiscent of an altar, which indicates an obvious link between the birth of Jesus and the Messiah, figure 44. The drawings in which the children unite the child Jesus and the Good Shepherd, figures 41 and 42, are another demonstration that the children do not stop at the fact itself, but rather, through it, they contemplate the mystery of Christ's person. Even more remarkable is the connection between the Nativity and the Mass that can be seen in drawing number 46, where the child, Jesus, dreams of the altar. In a Christmas drawing, Abby, five and a half years old, has illustrated the child Jesus shining with light, an element that likens him to the risen Christ, the Good Shepherd, and the bread and wine also radiating light, figure 45. Biblical Geography In our view, 
it is important that the historical events also have materials relative to their geographical reconstruction. In order to let the children know how to situate them, in a point in space. This material helps to concretize the events. Therefore, we present a globe of the world on which all the dry land is colored white and only one minuscule red point is marked out, the land of Israel. For the events surrounding the birth, we use a plastic relief model of the land of Israel, made to scale. First, we indicate the three principal cities of Nazareth, Bethlehem, and Jerusalem. Then we gradually localize and name the regions and other cities named in the gospel. Finally, we highlight the topographical features. We follow a process that is the reverse of what is generally used in the study of geography. Because the interest this country holds for us is primarily historical. Thus, the geography depends on the history. In relation to the Easter Pentecost events, we concentrate our study on the city of Jerusalem. We have built a relief model of the city to scale for the children to use. The historical buildings and city walls are movable. They can be isolated and reassembled on a large cardboard that outlines the exact dimensions of the three-dimensional model. This is the way the children learn the names of the places where the most important events of the Passion death, and resurrection took place. With regard to the events of the Passion, we restrict ourselves to indicating the location of the Cenacle, the House of Caiaphas, the Antonia Tower, the Temple, the Garden of Olives, Calvary, and the Tomb of the Resurrection. The texts offer a detailed account of the Passion but we believe these texts should not be given to the children. At times, these passages go into details that arouse horror, such as we could not bear in relation to anyone dear to us. Why then should we dwell on them with respect to Jesus? We risk inciting sentiments that should not be aroused. We concentrate on the Last Supper, the death and resurrection, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The presentation of the Last Supper is integrated with what has been presented previously on the Mass, especially in relation to the Epiclesis. During the Last Supper presentation, we emphasize Jesus' will to remain with people of all times. Therefore, we focus on the words of the consecration with which he expressed this will, designating as the ultimate end of the bread and wine that they be the signs of his perpetual presence in the midst of humankind and of his continuing intervention in the life of humanity. The material for the children's personal work on the Last Supper presentation consists of a wooden reconstruction of the environment a small model of the cynical, a table, three-dimensional figures of Jesus and the apostles, the bread and wine, and the gospel text. We read principally Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 17, and verses 22 through 24, omitting the betrayal of Judas which leaves too strong an impression on the younger children. The children work with the material in the usual way, reading the gospel booklet and moving the figures. The Last Supper is another event that readily lends itself to be celebrated by the younger children themselves, along with the older ones. 
A small group of 12 children gathers around a table. Each child chooses the name of an apostle. One child is entrusted with the task of saying the words of Jesus, which are written, depending on the age of the children, more or less according to the structure of the Jewish Paschal Banquet. When the supper is concluded, another child reads an abbreviated account of the death and resurrection. The actualization follows immediately afterward. Crucifix and lighted candles are brought to the table, transforming it into an altar. The circle of children widens to include all who are present. The children often linger for long periods of time around the improvised altar and express their prayers spontaneously. The Death and Resurrection The time when we come to speak of Christ's death and resurrection is the moment when the Good Shepherd parable is rooted in history. We have already said how the children intuitively grasp the paschal import of the parable. The Good Shepherd is always at the disposition of humankind, and this constant attitude of his is concretized in a particular way at the moment of his death. For a number of reasons, we hold especially to the Lucan version of Christ's death, chapter 23, verses 33 through 49. It is in Luke, above all, that we find the great pursuit of contrasts. He records the supreme moment of the humiliation of Jesus with frequent references to his kingship, verses 37 through 38 and verse 42. Jesus is king of a mysterious kingdom, one that is even like a mustard seed, so much so that at times it is difficult for us to see it. He is king on the cross as well. Luke explicitly cites Jesus' words of forgiveness and also his power to convert in regard to the good thief and the centurion, an element to which the children are most sensitive. Naturally, our choice of Luke is not exclusive. John's account, chapter 19, verses 17 through 30, offers us the opportunity of pointing out the presence of the pagans, the soldiers, and Jews, the mother of God and John, around the cross of Christ, and therefore to emphasize once again the universality of the event and, with the older children only, the shared responsibility of each of us for Christ's death. Nonetheless, the proclamation of the death of Christ should never be disjoined from the announcement of his resurrection. We believe it is necessary to tie them together. We do not even pause temporarily on the death alone, considering perhaps it a well-known fact that the death was followed by the resurrection. Yes, it is known, but the fact is that very often the accent is applied to the death, and so it comes to assume a greater vividness than the resurrection. The disturbing proclamation we give is of the resurrection, and it is on this that we should concentrate. Death is a common event. Many persons have had the courage to face death for love of their brothers and sisters. What is absolutely new is that in Jesus, death is followed by renewed and eternal life. What we find so hard to grasp is the fact that in Christ, life is stronger than death. To us, it seems appropriate to avoid long accounts of the Passion in order to balance the length of the Passion narration with the account of the Resurrection. As for the Resurrection text, it appears suitable to us to follow our preference for Luke once again, especially in relation to the striking passage 
Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Luke chapter 24, verse 5. We also read John's account because of its vivacity and the importance granted to Peter. The presentation of the Paschal events follows the same sequence as the infancy narratives. A brief introduction to acknowledge the liturgical time we are in and what event we will hear about from the Bible, along with a reference to either the raised surface map of the land of Israel or the city of Jerusalem, if they have begun to work with it. A solemn reading of the biblical text, a reflection or meditation with the children to set a fire only the most essential elements of the text, which readily flow into spontaneous prayer. The offering of a material to serve the child's continued reflection on and absorption of the text. There is, however, a difference. As we have seen, the parables lead especially to meditation and through it to prayer. The infancy narratives lead more directly to the personal and spontaneous prayer. The paschal events adapt themselves especially to be lived by the children in more structured celebrations. Given the great wealth of the paschal liturgy, these celebrations frequently retrace the great services of Holy Week and the Easter Triduum. As such, they become a direct initiation into the liturgy of the church. The Liturgy of Light The children live the proclamation of the death and resurrection, especially in the Liturgy of Light, which, through the contrast between darkness and light, involves us dramatically in the fundamental event in the Good Shepherd's life. Based on the observation of numerous children's drawings, we can say that the Liturgy of Light prevails over the historical approach. That is to say, once again, the children interpret the events theologically rather than chronicling them. In the drawing of Valerio, five years old, the crucifix is placed to one side of the page, the remainder of which is completely filled with blazing lights. Figure 43. In Roberto's drawing, there is the figure of the crucified Christ and also the risen Lord represented in two ways, in the paschal candle and as Christ the light. The light is also shared by a little boy and girl with the written explanation. The boy holds the candle in his hand. He has life like the risen Jesus. Figure 31. Note that the crucifixion has been illustrated on the lower part of the page with the paschal candle placed directly beside it. The figure of the risen Jesus, haloed with light, dominates the upper portion of the sheet. In many other drawings, the children entirely omit the depiction of the historical event, illustrating only the Paschal Candle. Pentecost. When we come to Pentecost, near the end of our catechetical year, the children already have a profound familiarity with the Holy Spirit. Our catechesis is Christocentric, as we have said, but it is obviously Christological Trinitarian. The person of the Father is illumined particularly through the Mass. It is the Father who sends us the gift of Christ's presence. And it is to the Father that we make our offering as the expression of our gratitude. We also speak of the Father, especially in relation to the Annunciation. The Father sends the messenger. And during the presentation of baptism, in the sign of the cross, the sacramental words, and so forth. 
With regard to the Holy Spirit, it is striking to see the facility with which the children enter into relationship with him. The Holy Spirit's work appears obvious to them, and they know how to recognize it spontaneously in the most important moments. The children come to know the Holy Spirit through the historical life of Jesus. It is through the Spirit that Jesus was born and raised from the dead, and also through the liturgies of the Eucharist and baptism. Therefore, the children know the Holy Spirit's work, both in the person of Jesus Christ himself and in his continuing work within the church. Franca, six years old, wrote on the back of her drawing of the risen Christ, The Holy Spirit made Jesus be born. When he rose, the Holy Spirit gave him more light. Good girls have gone to heaven, and the Holy Spirit has given life to Jesus' sheep too. What has been particularly enlightening for the children in relation to the Holy Spirit is to see his action in the Eucharistic presence. When we hit on this point, there was what Montessori would have called an explosion. Starting with this essential aspect, the children then knew how to see with ease the Spirit's many other manifestations. Given the children's familiarity with the Holy Spirit throughout the atrium year, Catechus regarding Pentecost does not present difficulties. We have only to read and meditate on Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The children also live this event, for the most part, through the celebration. The material consists of the scripture booklet, the reconstruction of the cynical used in the Last Supper presentation, and the figures of the apostles and the mother of God. In concluding, we would like to say that the presentation of sacred scripture, parables, or historical narratives should never be disunited from prayer in a structured or unstructured form. The proclamation is complete when it has been received and in one form or another when it has been given a response. At this point, we quote the following from a catechist diary Rome via Casalina, first class. As an example of the position the Holy Spirit occupies in the children's discussions, who gave life back to the Good Shepherd? The Holy Spirit, the little girl responded immediately with complete certainty. It was a new life of light that gives joy. Then where did Jesus go? To heaven, of course, with that beautiful life. But did he want to stay there alone? With the Father, with the Holy Spirit, with the sheep too, and with the Madonna. The sheep should follow the shepherd. How can the sheep get to heaven? The Holy Spirit helps us too, the actual words of the little girl. The Holy Spirit comes to bring us Jesus' life. When did he give it to us? When we receive baptism. But he gives it to me when I am with Jesus, when I am praying in church. The Holy Spirit is in church in the tabernacle, we already know that in the tabernacle there is Jesus. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are never apart. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are in our hearts. You don't see them. Who finds them? The person who pays attention. How does one pay attention? with the heart, 
with our life, too, thinking and listening to the Holy Spirit's words. If a little girl stays at her place really quiet, she hears him. Then the lesson on Pentecost followed. At the end of it, because we were late, the children proposed to reorder everything in absolute silence, to go out silently so they could listen to the Holy Spirit. And if someone's mother had not yet come, they would wait alone to one side. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We would like to thank all the contributing members because you are making this podcast possible. If you would like to know more about the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening this week. Merry Christmas, and go and fall more deeply in love with God.